ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You are in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hello and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. My name is Christopher Sutton. I'm the founder and director of Musical U. And it's my pleasure to be joined today by our Musical U team. Uh, We don't have our resident pros with us, but we have the the full lineup we normally have on our Monday morning team calls. Well, Monday morning, depending on which country you're in. For me, it's generally afternoon. But it is myself, Stuart, Adam, Andrew, and Anastasia. And we are going to be picking up on one of the common themes that came across in our episode 100 celebration roundup, where we had 26 fascinating music educators sharing their one top tip for unlocking your inner musicality. And the theme we're going to be picking up on today is the idea that we are all musical inside already. And I'm excited on this one because, as I jokingly said to my team before we kicked off recording, this is our mission statement, more or less, at Musical U. You know, this is our our brand, this is our message, this is what we're all about, is trying to help musicians feel like and be equipped like they are truly musical in a natural, creative, confident way. And so, of course, I was delighted when this came up with lots of our contributing guests. Um, we had Andrew, uh, sorry, Andy Wasserman talking about the musical gold inside you and how when you enjoy music you hear, it's because it's resonating with the music you have inside. We had Bill Hilton, David Reed, and Forrest Kinney talking about how you can be creative from day one, and you have that inside you. Even if you don't yet have phenomenal instrument technique, you do have the ability to create and express. We had David Andrew Weeb talking about specifically you already have musicality inside and you just need to tap into it. David Wallerman talked about how sometimes we need to put down our instrument to realize what we have inside and what we can express musically. And Jimmy Rotherham expressed the kind of could I philosophy, which is that we are all musical, we can all use our voice, we can all express musical ideas. And for him, that comes through in his work in inclusivity in school music and helping kids to all feel like they are musical, that they can sing, that they can take part in musical activities. So this is a kind of near and dear to our hearts, a musical you, and I'm excited to have the chance because, you know, we, I think we all take it for granted at this stage, having been working in musicality training for one to 10 years, depending on the team member. But it's rare that we sit down and actually really talk about it, except in the very specific way when we're developing new material. So broadly speaking, why don't we kick off with Stuart? Uh, what does it mean to you, Stuart, this idea that we are all musical inside already? Well, I think all of us listen to music in some way. Um, And uh, I always like to think if you can listen to the radio, tap your foot, whistle along, hum along, you can do something musical. Um, And I don't don't think many people think like that. And uh, it's a shame, really. Um, and And I got to know a little bit more about this and how deep it goes. I've written about it, but I also taught guitar. Uh, and it would always bum me out when I'd see people come in who, who were told, for one reason or another, you can't play guitar. And I'd be like, you know, well, why? You know, and luckily, th- thankfully, whoever was with them, a parent or whatever, said, let's try one more teacher. Um, so, like, one came in. It was, a, it was a woman who was about five foot, real short, but she had tiny hands. Uh, so the guitar, the, her first instructor was like, well, your, your hands are too small to play guitar, so you shouldn't play guitar. So she kind of was about ready to give up. So she came in and I talked to her and I said, well, I said, let's move your hand around a little bit. Next thing you know, we, we were doing lessons for a few years and she could play. Her big goal was to play music with her kids, you know, so they could sing and she could play. And she was able to do that. But thankfully, she moved on. It was it's kind of like not believing the lies that others will say. Um, you know, and that happens through, especially when we're young. And that stuff sticks with you, I think, through time. Um, I had stuff when I was young that was said to me and I know other people who've had the same thing, just negative little comments from teachers or other students like, Oh, you can't sing or, Oh, you can't do that. But it's like, no, 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 you, you can't, you can't, you have to, you know, to me as the community conductor on musical you, I get to see a lot of people come through that, that, uh, I don't know what you want to say, this, this, opening of their mind like I can do it 
and they get excited. And that's like one of the best days. You know, I love that's like a huge, great moment of my day when I see someone go, man, I'm getting this. This is really good. And it's like, see, you can do it. Don't believe the other stuff. So, uh, yeah. And it's great to be part of something that does that and those people on that. Nice. Yeah. I, I think we all enjoy seeing that with members and we've had for sure some dramatic cases where people come in and you almost wonder why they joined because they seem, seem so determined to fail and so determined that they don't have what it takes. And so when that turns around and they start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and they start, you know, seeing themselves do these things in music that they thought were beyond them, I, I think we all get a, a massive kick out of that. Yeah. Sometimes it just takes a little extra time. Um, I had, you know, the students, and I'm sure Andrew probably has some examples of this also, but uh, I had one student also, she had, uh, she was mentally handicapped. Um, I mean, she could work in it, but her mom brought her in. Once again, they had a teacher and he was just like, oh, she can't do it. You know, she's not it. But he came in and I worked with her and uh, she ended up having a blast. You know, she was doing it and the mom came in, this was like a few years after, and she said, thank you, you took the time with her and worked with her and she's doing music and she loves doing this. And then another guy, it was kind of funny. He didn't, it was, it reminded me of the, uh, what was it? Mr. Holland's opus, I think that movie. And there's a scene where this one guy has a really hard time with tempo. So Mr. Holland, he puts a helmet on his head and starts tapping on his head with a a drumstick. So the guy feels me here. Well, I had a guitar player and he came in and man, we, we tried everything. And he just could not get that steady beat. But I was like, I know this guy has it. So I took a drum. Now, I didn't start whacking him over the head. But I did tap on his knee with a drumstick. And eventually, it started really catching on, and he got it. <laughs> but it's like, you know, finding little unique ways to, to help people in. Yeah. And that's a nice example uh, where clapping in time is something that people really... I think clapping in time and singing in tune are the big two where everyone feels like everyone should be able to do this. But actually, if you haven't learned or you haven't happened to kind of absorb it passively, it can, it can be tricky. And it, it's been fun and interesting for us at Musical U figuring out how do we actually teach those skills in a step-by-step way while helping people pass the emotional and psychological baggage that may have been holding them back. Um, Stuart, you, you thankfully solved this for me. I forgot to ask everyone to introduce themselves. I think what came across in your answer is you're a guitar teacher and the community conductor at Musical U. Before we go ahead, I should just ask Adam, Andrew, and Anastasia to please give a quick intro for anyone listening who hasn't heard you on the podcast before. Adam, why don't you go first? Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Liette. I'm the communications manager at Musical U. Um, in addition to being a trumpet player and a guitar player, I'm a veteran of the United States Army Band. Hi, I'm Andrew Bishko. I'm the product manager on the Musical U site and content manager on the Musical U blog. I uh, play many instruments. Uh, currently, my big project is playing mariachi music with my wife in a wonderful mariachi band. Hey, my name is Anastasia Wojtynskaya. I'm the assistant content editor here at Musical U. Um, I've been a pianist since the age of three, a guitar player since the age of 10, and more recently I picked up the bass and the synthesizer. I also occasionally sing, um, so I currently play bass and sing in a band, and then I have my own experimental electronic project that is going to be my focus for the next little while in my musical life. Very nice. And why don't you continue for us, Anastasia, and uh, share a bit about your thoughts on what it means that we're all musical inside already? For sure. Um, So I think the most kind of basic thing to remember that people forget and that I forget sometimes when I'm in the throes of, oh, I'm not satisfied with what I'm making is... um, if you can enjoy music, you are in fact musical. It means that you have an ear for music. It means that you have a taste in music um, and you know what sounds good to you at least. So unless you're completely tone deaf, which is so, so rare, or you're just not paying attention. Also, you can hear music. You can appreciate it. You can suss out the dynamics, um, the phrasing, the articulation, the different, for example, guitar effects that someone is using, um, the different tones of a synthesizer. Um, for example, just as an exercise, you could try active listening to some of your favorite music and chances are 
uh, you're very capable of perceiving what about it you like, like what makes it musical. Um, is it kind of the melody? Is it the chord progression? Is it the way that it slows down and speeds up, for example? Um, and all of this to say, also, I think a core component of simply being human is also being musical because we are human and we do have feelings and they have to be expressed somehow. And what better avenue to express them than through music, right? Nice. Yeah. And I, I think there's a, an important point there, which I, I try not to over egg cause it is a simplification, but a lot of the kind of ear training stuff we talk about and train people on at musical U is fundamentally about equipping you with words and mental frameworks for things your ears are already doing. And yes, there are some skills where you need to go deep and really kind of get into the nitty gritty, but it's remarkable how often we have musicians join the members website who've been playing music for 10 years and they feel like they have a terrible musical ear. And in just a few weeks, they can totally transform because actually they just lacked a few of these kind of mental structures or ways of thinking about what they were hearing or words to put on things that once you put those things in place, they realize, oh, actually, I, I was understanding by ear what was going on. I just didn't have a way to grasp it. And so I, I think you're exactly right, Anastasia, that we can see in anyone who's enjoying music that they have some kind of musicality inside them. And and so it must just be a matter of, of bringing that out. I find that for me, at least, like from a fairly young age, and I saw this in other people that are just starting out on their instruments. Like when we play naturally, we tend to play pretty musically. We don't sit there and plunk out note by note by note unless someone tells us to do so. So for example, um, when I was taking piano lessons, uh, once I had learned everything, once I had gotten the notes under my fingers, once I'd gotten the technique down, once I was comfortable with the material, essentially, um, I wasn't playing robotically. I was playing pretty naturally. There were like some lulls. Again, not really changes in pitch or rhythm, obviously. I was still playing the same notes, but something was changing. I was kind of like injecting myself into the music. So, of course, it would change because I'm going to play a piece differently than how you would play a piece or how Andrew would play a piece. <laughs> So not to kind of technique is obviously so, so important, but I find sometimes it almost gets in the way because you're thinking too much about the technique and you're saying, Oh, I'm not musical. I can't get this. When in fact, if you just had the technique already under your fingers and you were comfortable with what you're playing, you would in fact be playing musically. You wouldn't be playing robotically because you would be thinking about other things such as how the piece makes you feel, how you can express yourself through it. Uh, what is the emotion behind it to begin with? So bottom line, I think our default is kind of playing musically, not playing robotically, and we're all capable of it. Yeah, fantastic. That's that's really well put. And in a way, it's a parallel barrier. You know, we, we talked just then about how one of the barriers is you don't have the words or the mental frameworks to understand by ear. But you're exactly right that the same thing happens in performance where technique is a barrier and the person sitting there feeling unmusical, they might just not have got good enough with the technique to reach that nice kind of green field of exploring it musically. And exactly. for me personally, one of the big things was learning how much of an impact it had if I memorized things. You know, I was a big sheet music reader. And as long as I was looking at the notes on the page, I always would be playing a bit robotically and kind of intellectually. And when I bothered to sit down and memorize it, it gave me a completely different opportunity to explore that music and express something with it. And yeah, I think it's that question of, you know, technique and how much you're needing to pay attention to getting the notes right. And once you move beyond that, you have the ability to let that musicality out. For sure. As your confidence increases, so does your musicality really, obviously, because you're more comfortable yeah, it's a two-way street, isn't it? You know, the more you put these skills under your belt, the more confident you are, and the more confident you are in them, the, the easier it is to to express something. How about you, Adam? How mm -hmm. how do you think about the subject of everyone being musical? You know, over the past hundred and some episodes of the Musicality Podcast, there's these moments that just stick out in my head, and I keep a file of these great quotes. And one thing that Andy Wasserman said 
He said, I believe that every single person is already a musical master. Just don't know it. I mean, I just love that quote. And I think that speaks so much to what we do. And I really found that both as a performer and a teacher, we, we get shoved in this perception of well, this is music. What is music? It's just a very, perhaps it's just a result of like modern music education or just a mindset of, well, now I'm making music, whatever that means. And I often wonder if we come in at music with that perception, does it shut us off from these new and exciting learning experiences as we explore this really wide world of music that's becoming more and more transparent and open to us with modern technology. And I just really like to expand upon a very unique cir circumstance that I had whilst I was serving overseas in Afghanistan. So I was a member of the 82nd Airborne Division Band, and in 2008, we got deployed to uh, Bagram Airfield, Afghanistan. And we had two jobs. The first job was just to play music. We played for soldiers. We played for dignitaries. I, I got to play for President Obama and uh, go the governor of Texas, you know, these, you know, you know really high-ranking people in our governments, which was cool. But we also had a job to train the Afghan National Army. That's actually what at the time was the biggest job of uh, ISAF was training the Afghans for to, they could, you know, guard their own country. And the Afghan National Army has a band, much like Western armies do. And a big part of our job was to train their band. We did this both at their, their equivalent of West Point, which is the American Military Academy, in Kabul, Afghanistan. In addition, we would host them at our camp in Bagram Airfield. And I'm a bit shamed, ashamed to say, at the time, I really dreaded having to teach the Afghanis. Uh, they just had no concept of Western tonality. They were playing on these instruments, Western instruments, trumpets, French horns, trombones, and the like, that they'd just been given by NATO in the past 18 months and so for the first time in their life, they're holding a clarinet and trying to make a sound. So they, they didn't even know how to play their own instruments, let alone any concept of John Philip Sousa, Henry Fillmore, Hulse, Carl King, all these, you know, very, very standard military march composers. I mean, we were even getting down to the root basics of reading Western notation. It was very, very painful to try to teach them even with translators. And then one night, what, what we typically did is on Friday nights, we would all get a bonfire going and we'd all sit out there drinking tea and, and smoking cigars. And the Afghanis came out of their tent. They heard us all talking and they, they just bring out this collection of just these ragtag beat up old instruments. It, but it was their native instruments. It wasn't our Western instruments. And they started playing just out there in the middle of nowhere. And I was completely blown away. I mean, all week long, we had struggled with these musicians, struggling with the mechanics and tonality and just basic musicianship of what we we're trying to teach them. And they were moving effort, effortlessly throughout their songs, playing entirely by ear. This went on for over three hours. We st stood outside there, just jaws dropped listening to them play and eventually joining in. They weren't just jamming. They weren't just improvising. They were playing songs. And these were folk songs that had been passed down for generations. And those that weren't playing would sing, sing in Pashtu, complete command of notes, rhythms, and the lyrics of their native songs. So they indeed had music inside of them. But we were approaching it from the wrong aspect. And I think that that has so much to do with what, what Kodai taught of using the folk songs from your native tongue to begin to teach music. I think that really speaks to that, this very real experience and with adult musicians. And But as I grew, as I look back on it, what surprised me the most in all of this has to do in context with history, because these musicians had lived through the oppression of the Taliban, two decades where music was strictly forbidden and was punishable by either corporal punishment or death. Yet through all this oppression, music lived on. And even in the very youngest musicians who lived, who were born into this oppression, music found a way to reach through the generations into them. 
And that is just, it's, it continues to inspire me to this day because it is inside all of us and it's multi-generational. And I think part of our job as musicians is to continue to pass this wonderful gift of music to the next generation and to everyone indeed that we meet. Wow. Well, that's an amazing story. And I, I love it too, as a, an example or a symbol of tapping into your musicality, you know, Stuart touched on a, a aspiring guitarist who'd been told her hands were too small. And uh, I think we fully all encountered people who tried an instrument, struggled and decided music wasn't for them. And the less common people who tried an instrument, struggled, tried another instrument, struggled, tried another instrument, found they loved it. And, you know, the, the choice of instrument or genre or, you know, cultural musical heritage, it's so powerful for our success in music. And, and so I loved how some of our guests talked about tapping into your inner musicality. And, you know, we often talk about unlocking it because it's not about creating something that isn't there. It really is about being willing to explore in music until you find the thing that resonates with you, until you find the instrument or the style of music or the opportunity to actually find out what you're capable of. And I, I hope that comes across in pretty much every episode of this podcast. You know, any time you're struggling or feeling unmusical, you're probably just not quite pointed in the right direction. And yeah, I love your story, Adam, because it, it's such a clear cut example of how people in one context can seem totally unmusical, but put them in another context and they'll blow your socks off. You know, it's amazing. How about you, Andrew? You, um, I, I so enjoyed interviewing you for the podcast in the past because of your kind of philosophy of music making. And I think that's probably what brought you to musical you in the first place and why you fit in so well in the team here. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this of, of what it means that we all have music inside. Well, music is, is, is natural. As nature is musical. When we think about the rhythm of the seasons, the rhythm of the wind and the rain and the rhythm of our own heartbeat, the melodies of the voices that move in and out of our lives. Everything is musical and we are immersed in this. We are part of this. I think a big, a, a big thing that's happened since the advent of recording and the available of, of pre-recorded music is that people get used to seeing the end product and they don't experience the process. They don't see, they don't uh, hear other people learning music. I know there's this one video about uh, African talking drum player where he's talking about how he learns music. They said, how did you learn to play the talking drum? Is oh, you know, it's from when we were kids. When we were three years old, we pick up the drum and we talk like this. You know, it was learned naturally like speaking. Uh, I remember when I was studying klezmer music and listening to uh, anecdotes about what it was like in the villages in Eastern Europe. And they said that people only stopped singing in order to talk to each other. They were always singing. They always had a little tune going. Everything was musical. Or uh, a, a friend of mine in Italy who uh, went to Naples, first moved to Naples in the, in the 50s, and he said, you walked through the street and everybody was singing. Sing song was flowing out of the, the, the windows and the rooftops, and all the, the vendors were singing, where music is a part of everybody's life. And so the learning process of being a child and allowing yourself to express musically is a natural part of your growing. My, I look at my own children and I see my children are musicians. They're sheep herders. <laughs> they're dishwashers. They're mathematicians. Mm -hmm. They're scientists. There's not that segmentation. But in our society, we have this thing of specialists. What are you going to be? You know, you ask a child, what do you want to be when you grow up? How could you segment that? Limit that. Limit your possibilities. 
And so that disconnects us. And so we think, oh, well, that person's going to be a scientist. That person's going to be a musician. That person's going to be this. That person's going to be that. And so we give up our innate musicality or we're talked out of it. So um, the truth about music is that it's always about the music. I have a master's degree in music, but I can listen to somebody who knows three chords and sings a song that they wrote and uh, with envy (laughs) of their musicality and their expression. It doesn't matter how much education you have. It doesn't matter how many notes you, you can play. It doesn't matter how much training you have or what you can do. It's about the music. It's about the sound that's happening in the moment. So uh, not to put all that other stuff down because it's wonderful. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's part of our nature. And, it, and, and it's been it's, uh, our, with this culture of specialization we're separated from that. Um, another thing is that people think they have to wait until I have to have this skill before I can do that. I have to have this skill before I can do that. Uh, I've talked to members uh, doing uh, discussions on is that musical use site. I'm, I'm working towards improvisation. I'm going to do this, this, and this, and then I'll start improvisation. And It's totally backwards. Improvisation, creating music, songwriting can be a part of your expression from day one. And in fact, you'll learn faster through that. And that's what it's all about. There's no, it's, everything else is procrastination. It's like, you want to make music, make music now. Skills are something that you're adding to it. and, And skills are also developed in that way. You play a scale. Why do people hate playing scales so much? Because you just go up and down and up and down. It doesn't happen in music. You know, maybe a couple of Mozart pieces, they would play a scale. But otherwise, you don't even play scales in music. Play with the scale. Don't play the scale. Play with the scale. Play up and down and inside out and play with the notes and play here. If you have a little technical part, you work it out. Make a little melody. Make it creative. Improvise with it allowing us to express our inner musicality every step of the way where music is not the goal, but it, music is the process. It's something that we're doing all the time. And then we're just adding skills to that and adding to our toolbox. Lovely. That, that is something I just like to underline because if I could go back to myself as a 12 year old and share that it would have had a dramatic impact on me, that idea that, <clears throat> excuse me, whether or not you aspire to be a songwriter or whether or not you aspire to be an improviser, those are things which completely transform your relationship with music and your enjoyment of the learning process. And if I could just go back and kind of open my eyes to the fact that improvising could be my way of learning the pieces, my way of learning dynamics and phrasing and technique, whether or not I had any interest in being an improviser, that would have been a a massive gift. So for anyone listening who's never tried to improvise and kind of tunes out when hearing about improvisation, I hope you'll, you'll think a little bit about this idea that it is simply a word we put on the idea that you can express your own inner musicality and that technique doesn't need to be a barrier and that learning the words and the mental frameworks and the ear training skills doesn't need to be a barrier. We all have some way of expressing ourselves in music from day one, the first time we pick up an instrument. I have so enjoyed talking to you guys. I I knew I would, and I was curious to hear what would come out because as I touched on at the beginning, this is something we are all immersed in day in, day out, and something we are often trying to communicate, but something we rarely actually discuss in the team. So I've really enjoyed this. I hope our listeners have enjoyed the conversation as much as I have. All that remains is to say a big thank you to Stuart, Adam, Andrew, and Anastasia for joining me on this episode. Thanks to everyone for listening, and we will see you on the next one. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcast listeners. 
That's musicalitypodcast.com.